So for me, this uh, specifically means um, learning how nature makes fuel from sunlight. So if nature can do that, then that's a problem that we can solve too. So we'll start this off by looking at this image of the world at night. So obviously this is a compilation of many pictures of the world at night because not all the world is at night at once. But uh, what you can see in this picture is uh, basically where technology is. So um, we have a lot of uh, technology in you know, the, the Northeast and you know, America, Western Europe. And, uh, and then there's a lot of places here that are, that are dark. So what about these dark places? They're not going to be dark forever. As technology spreads and increases quality of life for everybody everywhere, um, these places will start lighting up. So there's a lot of dark on this map, so that means that there's going to be a lot of places that are going to start to need power. Where are we going to get all that power from? Um, our typical sources of power are things like fossil fuels, you know, your coal, your petroleum, natural gas. Then there's a very small fraction of so-called renewable sources a lot of wind, uh, water, geothermal, nuclear, and uh, solar, which I save for last because, you know, you always save the best for last. So why do I think solar is better than all of the other options? Well, for one, wind power, if you wanted to, pe uh, you have a question. Because uh, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. So, you know, well, I was starting to say this thing about wind that, you know, to get, um, to get enough wind power to power the Netherlands right now, you would need a, a wind farm that's bigger than the Netherlands. So wind, um, water and geothermal are both very geographically limited. You only have them in certain places. Nuclear is a really uh, almost inexhaustible source of energy, but then you have like Chernobyl and Three Mile Islands and that Japanese plant that like melted down, ruined places of habitation for hundreds of years. So that's why I have a sad face next to nuclear because people get cancer and have babies with three arms and all sorts of things like that. Bad. But solar has none of these problems. So solar energy, if it's so great, why aren't we using it already? <laughs> so one awesome thing about solar energy is that at every second, the sun is supplying power uh, 100,000 terawatts. So for perspective on what 100,000 terawatts of power means, um, Currently, the globe is using about 17 terawatts of power, and the global usage estimates go up to maybe in the range of 30 to 50 terawatts over the next 100 years. So basically, the sun is supplying more than a thousand times more power than we will ever conceivably need. And if we ever start exceeding 100,000 terawatts, our problems are going to be much bigger than trying to find power for everybody. So if it's so great, why aren't we using it already? Uh, well, clearly, the sun shines during the day. It's kind of the definition of the day. So when the sun goes down, your power turns off, you know? So that's really good. Um, and then certain times of year, you get a lot more sun. Certain times of year, you get a lot less sun. So that's bad. And then some, some places in this world, like where I'm from, Southern California, you get a lot more sun than in some other places, like, you know, Alaska. Um, and then all the sun is shining sort of everywhere. And if you want to use it, something, you actually have to kind of concentrate it down into a very small spot. So um, basically, if we wanted to use solar energy overall as a power source for the entire world, we have to come up with a way to be able to store that energy it around when we want it, where we want it. So people in, you know, Alaska are absolutely screwed when, you know, it's that time of year, there's sun period. So how do you store energy? Um, we have batteries as one option, maybe your run-of-the-mill alkaline battery or maybe your more state-of-the-art Toyota Prius battery here. Um, there's also uh, fuels, natural gas, petroleum, coal. So does anybody know what the, the mileage range of plug-in Prius is, how far you can drive on pure electric battery power? So the Prius battery is apparently 10 to 15 miles. Chevy Volt is the best we have and about 50 miles can drive on the st strength of electric power. And this is our best of battery technology. This is the best we got in battery. I'm thinking no, batteries are not the way to go. So we need to come up with fuel. You have your hand up. Well, if we could use the sun to power the batteries and you know um, charge the batteries, that would be one option. Currently, we also fuel. We have power plants that are 
Speaking of batteries, there are batteries dying. My, oh, my, my mic battery? Mic battery is dying. Okay. Can this thing run on solar or? <laughs> well, you know, if we, uh, mm. whenever we crack that intractable problem, then, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but they're not really, I don't think they're, yeah. There, yeah, there are technologies of batteries that are not really commercialized yet that are much better, obviously. Just like, there are cars that are like really powerful, but we, not everybody can drive. It's kind of a question of just how, what can you have throughout the globe. Anyway, so going back onto why I don't think batteries are awesome. And, you know, so fuel is the best way we have to store energy. You can get a lot of energy per small amount of fuel. And yeah, thanks guys. Anyway, um, so what makes a good fuel? Why are the fossil fuels so good? Well, let's look at the, the structures of the kinds of fuels that we have from the fossil fuel world. We have natural gas, methane, with a uh, chemical structure of CH4, or chemical formula, excuse me. Oil, however many C's are in this particular oil, and lots of H's. And then coal, lots of carbons, lots of hydrogens. So, as you may surmise from this, the energy is stored in those carbon and hydrogen bonds. And the, the highest uh, density of energy comes when you have more hydrogens to carbon atoms in a particular fuel molecule. So natural gas has the most density of energy. So these fuels had to come from somewhere. And it turns out um, from all this biomass that died and then fell into the, the dense center of the earth where they were pressure cooked for billions of years and then turned into the very simple molecules that I showed on the previous slide and here. So this is gasoline on your left and methane on your right. But the biomass had to come from somewhere. You know, if fuel has energy. There's, you know, one of the basic principles of the world is that energy is conserved. So the energy had to come from somewhere and to make the biomass, which then turned into the fuel. So turns out it all came from photosynthesis. So t turning sunlight into fuel. So every bit of energetic equivalence we have on this earth actually came from solar energy. You want, you want to know why I believe in solar energy? That is why. <laughs> because it all was solar energy in the end. The overall process of photosynthesis happens via taking carbon dioxide and water and then um, using this, the energy of sunlight to combine those things and to make a bigger structure from it. So um, in this case, photosynthesis makes glucose, so that's a sugar, which then the plants use to um, build up bigger structures like starch and such, which then they um, form like cellulose, which is a polymer of this sort of thing, which then can actually make this giant tree. Um, and then it releases oxygen as a waste product. A waste product that we're very grateful for. Makes our lives possible. So all the biomass in this world came from photosynthesis. And so did all of our oxygen. Um, so solar energy, pretty cool thing. Give us all of our fuels. So if, the, if they gave us all of our fuels to begin with, and they're solar energy, what makes them bad? You know, we, we have all this flack on fossil fuels. So what are the drawbacks of it? Many people would say it's because we're running out. Well, that's not true. We're actually not running out. Um, as you know, you've heard about like fracking and stuff. There's really are stores of fossil fuels that are, uh, available, but they're just maybe slightly less accessible. But there are definitely hundreds of years at least of fossil fuels still around. So we're not running out. So the problem then is that using them has a dark side, and that is greenhouse gases. Ah! The greenhouse effect, we, we throw this around a lot. I, I think we kind of generally associate it with um, getting hotter. But why does it get hotter? So in this little we kind of have a, a demonstration of why. So we have this lovely Earth and atmosphere that prevents the UV light from you know, burning us all to an absolute crisp. And so um, the sun radiates us with light. And a lot of those uh, wavelengths of light that are actually useful to us, the, the visible region of the spectrum, is permeable, uh, the, I mean, the atmosphere is permeable to it. So it can actually get into the atmosphere. And then those, those uh, rays heat things up on the Earth, and then we start to re-emit radiation. So we actually re-emit radiation in the infrared region. This, this light doesn't actually permeate. So that actually ends up getting reflected back into the atmosphere. And one characteristic of um, infrared light is that it heats things up. So then you have infrared light um, heating things up, the more things you have that are um, vulnerable to infrared light, like carbon dioxide, water, 
water, methane, etc. Um, the more things you have warming as a result of that ion. And as those things get trapped, then you have them, them heating up, heating up, heating up, and then it gets hotter and hotter and harder. Global warming, disasters. Ah so you've probably experienced the more practical version of the greenhouse effect. Your car windshield is permeable to uh, uh, wavelengths of the visible region of light, but not to the IR radiation. So then sunlight goes into your car. If you, uh, things in your car emit um, IR radiation. Can't get out of the windshield. Bounces back, bounces back, bounces back. It gets really hot. Ugh. So that's the, the practical greenhouse effect. And then just imagine that on a global scale. The, if the earth heats up like it heats up when it's left in the sun. We really need to solve this problem. So the carbon cycle. Um, it's kind of a, a, a way where we, we can look to like how, how we can you know, use carbon dioxide so that it doesn't just get sent into the atmosphere. So photosynthesis actually takes carbon dioxide and fixes it into something useful, like fuel, right? And then we, the, the, the other side, um, we take glucose and we use it for energy and then we release carbon dioxide. And also combustion is the same thing. So like when we, when we take fuels and then burn them um, for energy, then we also do the same kind of process as respiration. So basically you have a cycle where photosynthetic organisms fix carbon and then we unfix it. So the problem here is actually just balance. You know, it should be a cycle. We should be, we should be using the, the things that the, the plants are, are uh, fixing and vice versa. You know, it should be cyclic. But the problem is balance. We break more plants, uh, more fix. They spent billions of years making those fossil fuels and then we're burning them at you know hugely rapid rates and so it's kind of like we're sending more carbon dioxide in than we can handle like drinking from a fire hose. So it's not good for the plants. So so if we want to you know do a balancing act here we have to make like a leap. Learn how to use carbon dioxide for a source of fuel and so for this uh, people like me study artificial photosynthesis where we use the power of the sun to make carbon you know, plants can do it, so can we. So I look at photosynthesis, and then we try and see why photosynthesis actually works. How does it do it? It turns out that the, the central reaction of it is water. So, so uh, two molecules of water get blasted open by the energy of the sun and release their constituents, um, oxygen atoms, and uh, protein and electrons. And then the protons and the electrons are both uh, used for processes in, in the plant cells. And the oxygen is just released as a very useful waste product for us. So this reaction is really difficult. In order to do it, it requires a lot of energy. And then not only does it require a lot of energy, but it also has a very complicated path to actually go through all the way. And so it requires a catalyst that can actually take that path and make it much simpler. So, um, if we want to learn how to do this um, for ourselves, we can look at how nature does it. What kind of nature use to make this pathway easier? So, these little manganese oxygen cubes that are actually nature's catalyst. So, um, nature actually uses this to carry out the water splitting reaction, and um, it, it does with these really cheap materials. So manganese, dirt cheap, calcium, dirt cheap, oxygen, obviously, every. So this is kind of how, you know, this is the, the aim. This is what we're trying to do, trying to make this. So men can make catalysts, too, or women. Uh, we have tried. There was the original water splitting catalyst made by man back in 1982, which was based on this element, and then some other carbon, oxygen. Uh, a little later, in 1999, one that actually used manganese, a la natural photosynthesis. And then the compound that I work on is um, this iridium-based uh, catalyst. So they're all, you know, they're very simple uh, materials. And I should just point out that uh, whoa, those ones made here at Yale in my very own research group. So we have catalysts and nature is catalysts. What's the problem? You know, we have man versus nature. Oh, nature wins. So um, it turns out that in order to actually implement this technology, we need something that is both, that is all cheap, sturdy, and effective. Right now our catalysts are cheap and sturdy, sturdy and effective, or cheap and effective. You can only get two out of three. And so like the, the previous I showed you the original 
Very slow, barely carrying reaction in on a perceptible time scale. Um, the fabulous one made out of manganese that's so, so much like the natural system it falls apart after four runs, so that's not going to be term viable. Um, iridium catalyst that I love so much, based on iridium, which is the most element, so kind of expensive, more expensive than platinum for some perspective. So not going to be making a large scale technology out of iridium. So how are plants able to do it? As you all know, the sun burns a lot. But we heal, and then we turn into perfectly normal colors with all of Will Ferrell's craziness. Um, so plants are actually doing this regeneration of their catalyst every 30 minutes fast the them. And so we have to one-up nature. We have to come up with a material that doesn't need to heal because do you know of any like non-living things that are able to heal themselves? I don't. So we have to come up with one that is able to live within that framework that it doesn't have to heal. So this gives us a mission, a, you know, a framework to start studying. So we need to come up with catalysts that have the, all of the big three. We need to be expensive, sturdy, efficient. And then that's only one part of the problem. Water, water splitting is part of it, but so is carbon fixation. And then so is um, you know, actually concentrating the sunlight in order to power the water oxidation reaction. So, um, and then once we have it all figured out, then we actually have to make an infrastructure where we send all this power out into the world. You know, it sounds pretty difficult. But you know what? We put a man on the moon when we wanted to, you know? Like, like uh, the politics were like, we want to go to the moon before Russia. And then we said, OK, we'll study science, and we'll figure it out. And you know what? We, so I think all this goes to show that science rocks. And you guys are doing it. So with that, questions?